Hi there, this is the first video in a series where I'm going to tell you in a very easy way how perspective works. So that you can make quite interesting photos like here, where the flowers look as big as the trees. Now if you stumble upon this video as a photographer, you probably think, what is it worth to me? Because perspective is something for people who like to draw or paint, so that it is not so flat and unrealistic as the Egyptians did it, but really life-like. But that couldn't be further from the truth, because perspective happens to be an interesting uh, technique and, and understanding you need to have to make very beautiful photo compositions. And furthermore, it is something you need to know as a starting point to really understand how lenses work. And that's of course half of photography, half of the camera. So, in many amateur courses they give exercises like get me some photos which have something to do with perspective and then you get things like this. This is already perspective because you have these converging lines towards the distance but it's not the most exciting thing of course you can do with perspective. You could do something like this for example, go to the fancy fair and shoot it there where the toys live or this coordination between the flowers in the bottom and all the interesting lines of the building. It looks almost expressionistic in its uh, deformed style. Or you can go even weirder, you can go from very high all the way downwards or something like this, which is quite interesting because this building looks like it's going in this direction and this building looks like it's going in this direction, although they're side by side if you look a little bit more careful. So this should go in this direction and this should go in this direction, but it's, pu it's purely perspective and not even difficult things like uh, non-linear perspective of uh, fisheye lenses or something like that. It's, it's simple perspective still, but you have to photograph it in the right manner. Or you can make people look bigger than houses, and that's a technique to make them look impressive. Or you can do worm perspective from below, or you can have even non-linear perspective. That's where it becomes more interesting. If you have curved objects, then lines don't stay lines, but they become, and this line here suddenly becomes a smiley on the face of this spot. That will be for the more advanced videos. So what's actually going on? You have a room or some three-dimensional scene where you can put some objects and of course you can also configure, compose eh, the objects. That's something we will see in later videos. On the ground plane or even hanging somewhere in the air. But we will talk about what you can do as a photographer moving around and turning your camera and things like that. So we like to uh, composition wise talk about the foreground objects. If you're shooting from here the red thing would be in the foreground. If you're shooting from the, the right side the green uh, thing would be in the foreground. So about here is the foreground. Sometimes people use the middle ground. There's a background which in this case could be a wall. There can even be a ceiling. Now how can we place our camera and the sensor of the camera or a canvas to paint on. That will be some two-dimensional thing and it will represent everything in the three-dimensional world. So what you need to do is somehow project all these points here. For example, you could project them uh, all orthogonal to the plane and that's a way you could do perspective but not the natural way to do it. So you could have another view uh, at an angle and pointing in this direction and, and at another position also. What are parameters of the image? The width, the height and the midpoint and width and height together give the aspect ratio. And this midpoint you can position somewhere in the real world. So if this is, you call this the origin of the world, you can go for example, uh, let's say five meters or two meters or whatever uh, to here and then you have your distance to the scene, maybe six meters, and you have the height of the photographer holding his camera. These are important parameters that you can change by bending uh, your knees or uh, stepping on a chair or whatever. But also you have angles. So there's a line of sight which starts at the position of the middle of your image and it goes in a certain direction towards the scene, straight ahead. If you keep your camera level and it goes straight ahead, but you can also tilt it, of course. You can have a variable pitch 
upwards or downwards you can have a jaw you can turn it uh, in, in, in towards or away from the camera capturing this video and uh, turn the camera to the left and the right as a photographer you could also roll it uh, so that it is not correctly uh, positioned and then of course the horizon will start uh, tilting but sometimes that's something you want to do but most of the time you want to keep it level and you want to play on distances and of course pitches and jaw because you point them to something you want to see more of like the ceiling or less of them and more of the ground so these are the choices but they have perspective consequences also so six degrees of freedom three angles three position uh, choices for the cameraman and an infinite freedom of course for configuring your scene now I wasn't looking over the shoulder of Mr. Brunelleschi in the Renaissance who invented the perspective laws, but I can explain it to you if you go to the swimming pool and you put your eye, uh, close the other one and put your eye just above the water and look at the wall here with maybe some windows in it and see how it reflects on the water. And what you then see is, you see somehow these windows are reflected on the water in an inverted manner and the higher something is the closer it comes to you and it also narrows down it, it's wider here but it becomes narrower and narrower so somehow everything is moving towards some kind of special point and that happens to be the center of your pupil or of your camera lens so actually from the center of the pupil we can now draw lines towards everywhere around us well at least the part in front of us maybe not the part behind our back or behind our camera for example this duck or the eye of the duck will give a unique line between the point here center of the pupil and the point here eye of the duck or beak of the duck or tail of the duck or whatever so that's all there is in perspective it's about drawing lines so it isn't that difficult as one might think so you could have a line in this direction, you could have this direction, everywhere, everything is determined. Each point in the three-dimensional world is, via this fixed pupil or center of projection, determined, determines a certain line or direction. It's easier if we look at it as a top view. So now this is one of the windows in the wall over here, and here we just have the water now from above and here is our eye and now again everything is projected through the center of our eye but now on some kind of shape where it is recorded that would be the back of our eye um, globe eh? ball our eyeball the the so-called retina and in a sensor in a, in a camera that would be the sensor plane it will be smaller than actually this uh, big line uh, it will end somewhere but in principle you could project anything wherever it ends up you could also put something in front of you and that's the canvas and again if you start painting you could project everything towards your eye and then see where it crosses with the canvas and then the window appears to come out of the canvas. It's now smaller, of course, than it is in reality. Also here, on the back of the camera, eh, on the sensor, you will have an even much smaller image because typically this canvas here will be maybe one meter in front of you. And here in a camera, it will be uh, some centimeters or something. So that's why you get a hundred times smaller uh, representation on the sensor. At 35 millimeter or whatever so actually if we uh, now make a canvas in front of us half of it will be above the water and half of it below the water and we have a point on the canvas which is on water level which is in front of our eye which is also on water level and then we can start projecting all these lines, eh, for example, the bottom parts of the uh, window 
and it will generate another window shape on the canvas. And <coughs> if you now have a window which is closer by, for example, just in front of the canvas or something, then it will look bigger and the extent on the canvas of far away objects will look smaller because if you draw the angles towards something nearby it will give a bigger angle and so also a bigger line on the canvas at a fixed distance than if you go further. So also if you see it in the top view it's easier then we can say in an image, whether it's projected on a canvas for painting or the mirror version in the camera, because there the everything, uh, what you could see here, everything that goes to the right in the real world, because it's here flipped, goes to the left in the camera sensor. So on your image, the further something is, the smaller it will look, here in purple. And the closer the same size window is, the bigger it will look. And yeah, if you put it even in front of the canvas, then you can also project it and then it will become even bigger. Now let's make it a little bit more interesting and realistic. Let's move a little bit out of the water with our body and then our eye is at a certain height h. And then we have at the same position, we have a so-called ground line, which goes through the water again. And now what we see, there is some line, if the water or anything that goes towards infinity, if you had a very, very, very big swimming pool, then we would see the end of it at a certain position as a line. And if we look straight on, that would be in the middle of our uh, canvas or our photographed camera sensor image and that's called the horizon so everything at infinity is horizon. water closing by, closer by will be lower so and on this straight in front of it there's a vanishing point and that's where all the lines that go parallel in the real world besides us come together so for example if you didn't have a swimming pool but tiles on the swimming pool, square tiles in the real world, they would all look deformed like this on lines which all go to the same vanishing point. And again closer by or further uh, away objects lie higher uh, and are smaller. In the two-dimensional representation. So parallel lines in real world on the floor become slanted lines in the image of the 3D world. And that's for all lines through. We see it here, it's not just for the lines on the floor, they all move up here, but also for example these uh, lines here of the bricks, they also move up here also the ceiling moves up here, everything moves to this point. This is an interesting point because what is it? It is the height of the photographer. The eye of the photographer is exactly at this height of the door because he's looking straight in front of him. There's also a line I cannot draw which goes straight orthogonal out of the picture here towards the middle of your eye or my camera and so you, you look straight on its edge and it will not have any length, it will look just as one point. And that's the straightforward uh, point and that's normally in the middle of your image if you're straight, shooting straight. But it can of course, you can, if you want to see something downwards and then the real world horizon, the more you move your camera downwards and downwards and downwards, eh, you angle it, then the real horizon will be much higher in the image. But there's some, still this middle line is some kind of virtual quote-unquote horizon. And you could, for example, select it. These lines of this angled bridge, they also go to a certain position. And if you turn your camera at exactly the angle of this bridge, then the middle of your image will correspond to the horizon which corresponds to 
all these slanted, uh, angled uh, bridge uh, lines. I did it here again. Uh, you, I shoot a little bit downwards pointing because the gardens here on the roof were somewhere on the 50th floor or something. But and then you see the real horizon of the world, infinity in front of us, is again higher than the middle, so we know we're pointing downwards. Here also eh, you have a guy, I don't know why he's uh, lying down here, because if he's photographing this from this distance, his height will not vary much, but maybe he can stabilize himself or turn it. So it's, it's, it's not the height of somebody that raises the horizon, some people think that, eh, because in a painting convention sometimes they, if they want to paint somebody who appears to be sitting on a horse, then they paint the horizon very high. But that's actually because if he's sitting high, he's probably looking down on all the footmen. Eh? Here again, a lot of ground plane and a little bit of uh, horizon and, and, and sky above, because what I wanted to do here is of course focus on what's happening here, which is much more interesting than a lot of bland sky. Now, what can also happen, I suppose that these tiles on the floor, they are not uh, all parallel going straight in front of us, but they turn, let's say, 30 degrees. Then they also come together at the point which is now not in the middle of our image but it's offset at a certain distance depending on the angle you have here. Now I could do that by retiling the entire floor but I can also do that of course by turning my camera. Uh, if the lines were like this and I turn my camera in this direction then suddenly they will appear as if they were in the other direction. So we see here from the top view again easily what's happening. Let's say the I turn my camera 45 degrees or then it looks like the tiles are in a 45 degree direction so all the tiles are in this direction and I draw one of them which goes through my eye that makes it easy because then the one which goes through my eye at 45 degrees uh, compared to straight in front will intersect a position in the projection plane, so in the canvas, or in the photo if you do it in the other direction, which for 45 degrees happens to be exactly the distance to my canvas. So if I know how far my canvas is, I can draw without even having to put the tiles on the floor, I can know where to which point on the horizon they will all move, namely this distance d. So if this is one meter, I need the canvas of one meter. And if you then watch a photo, eh, which may be much smaller, but in such a manner, with such a distance, that the distance that it happens to have on the photo creates exactly the same 45 degree angle, then it looks like a realistic picture, like you kind of were there, not in 3D, but in 2D. So it looks very immersive. And so, if the canvas has, for example, a point on, uh, let's say, one meter, and the photo is one tenth of that, you also have to move it ten times closer to your eye to again have the same angles and have it look like the canvas or even the real world that you have. And that's something that people in, in, in Hollywood know very well. And so they have a real world and then they, for example, paint they, they use a glass uh, plane here and they paint a castle on it. And if you make sure that the angles are correct, it looks like you would really have a castle here in the distance, but you can draw it now very small. But again, with the angles you should have, and then you have a very cheap um, special effect. Nowadays you do it with computer graphics and dinosaurs and so on, but still you have to keep all the angles correct to make it look realistically. This teaches us also something else. If we take again the 45 degree um, uh, line, and I said that the position where that crosses becomes larger the more distance you had, because 
this was equal to the distance you had to your eye here. So the further you position your image plane from, let's say, the center of the lens, the further this distance becomes. And of course, your sensor has a certain size. So Taylor lenses have a property that this, this, this focal distance becomes longer and longer and longer. So they can do smaller and smaller and smaller angles. And this is the last position that you can steal 45 degrees, but with the same size sensor, a little bit further, you can do only maybe 30 degrees and so on. That's why tele lenses zoom in on a small angle. Now, if we turn to the uh, left or the right, we move our point to the right or the left. So you can imagine also that uh, by turning down or up, the vanishing point on its new horizon will also move up or down, as we already saw with the previous examples of the bridge going down there, the horizon. And we look down and the horizon went up. It's always in the opposite direction. And because you turn your camera, it looks like you turn the world in the opposite direction. So here we have an interesting example already in San Francisco Lombard Street. So the real horizon of the real world is somewhere over here. And that's where all the lines of the houses converge. Because of course, even if they look a little bit uh, slanted, they built all these houses exactly uh, straight because otherwise everything rolls to one side of the room. So this is all straight and all their lines will again converge to the horizon somewhere. Apparently these are under another angle than these, so they don't converge to the same point. And also it's all to this side because I've turned my camera a little bit towards these houses to show much more of these houses than the little bit over there. So all of that you can learn. But also, of course, the road goes up and it goes up quite steep. That's why the whole day long these people are winding. They, they love to drive this road. And uh, this is then the horizon of the upgoing slanted uh, plane. And if the houses were following that direction, but then they would be all skewed, then all lines of the houses would come somewhere on that horizon. So you can have quite more interesting, uh, now that we know the principles, we can also understand very interesting uh, three-dimensional structures like this house. What did I do? I positioned myself really orthogonal, straight in front of this part of the building. So all these lines, they are nicely parallel. They don't converge somewhere. Well, formally you could say they converge at infinity because the angle is negligible so it takes an infinite amount of time till they come together but in practice we say they are really parallel and nothing moves toward anything so that's how i know i'm quite correctly positioned quite orthogonal uh, compared to this plane here eh? so i didn't turn compared to that plane to the left or the right but I did turn a little bit upwards because I wanted to see here the ceiling and not so much of the floor. I could have photographed floor, but it's not so interesting. So that means that the rest of this building, eh, these lines already start converging a little bit. The more I would have turned upwards, the more they would have converged. But now something else is going on. Not everything is just a square in, in one direction uh, with tiles and, and, and maybe at a different depth that doesn't matter but the same orientation, some doors and uh, all of it here is just square in front of us. But this, for example, the stairs is tilted upwards from the floor or compared to that square in front of us, tilted a little bit towards the back. That's why these lines converge again eh, towards something which is higher than eh, because it looks like we tilt ourselves a little bit away from it and here we have this house is very interesting because the wall in front of it is not like the wall in the back but it turns a little bit towards the back here so we see that because all the 
lines like these bricks on this wall they move towards a point which is now not in the middle but again com corresponding to this turning angle it's again somewhere to the left so you see we can with these techniques understand quite complicated structures and we can use it to our advantage also to photograph quite interesting structures so the summary if we have a couple of lines all around us, see the simplest uh, situation where we have a bundle of lines all going away from us, and, uh, but they're everywhere above us and below us and to the side, further and further and to that side. So we have all these lines, for example, on the floor, all parallel, and also here they can be at a certain height on the wall. Then I can also associate angles with all these lines but in a two-dimensional representation they will appear to converge all to a certain point and if they happen to go straight away from us then that point will be in the middle because our eye will also look at the middle of the canvas well assuming that you stand in the middle of the canvas eh? so turning my camera to the right or to the left or in other, ways, in other words I can do that around a vertical line I can turn around it eh, around my thumb if I do that the vanishing point will move to the left or the right if I turn my camera upwards or downwards so I bend my neck and the camera goes with it towards the floor or I go backwards and I start watching the sky or in other words I turn now around my thumb which is in the horizontal direction pointing to the left that will move my uh, vanishing point upwards or downwards and it's always opposite so turning my neck backwards from a skyscraper is the same in if, if I think that my camera plane or my world is fixed it looks like the skyscraper is moving in the other direction it's, it looks like it's falling down so the lines will start converging like these stairs eh, we had in the previous photo somewhere above the horizon by the way a rolling camera and that's when you don't have it leveled eh, but you turn it a little bit but you keep it in a plane which is orthogonal to your line of sight pointing towards the distance but you turn it a little bit to the left or right that also moves of course these uh, points a little bit that's not so interesting we usually want to watch more of the floor or the, sk the sky or turn our camera a little bit to the left because there's more to see on that side or to the right so now we know about what a photographer can do but the next question is, what about objects in the world now? You can look at a cube like this, uh, with lines all going in this direction, and everything is behind the face, but you can also start turning it. And then you can have this, this is one point perspective, eh? we have one point, then you have two point perspective, and that makes the objects and the world a little bit more interesting. Because you have all parallel lines here, but they're in a face going in this direction and the other one is orthogonal to it so it goes in a totally different direction and this is almost parallel to us if we were to turn the building or, or put ourselves just in front of it then all these lines would become parallel again and we, we didn't see we wouldn't see this then uh, but by setting ourselves on the diagonal uh, we could have a symmetrical uh, set of lines or in this case it's almost symmetrical so these lines of the facade go to this direction, these lines go to this direction. So we have now two points which control the perspective. So everything comes from this point. If it are uh, lines going in the distance in this direction and uh, towards the left, if they go more slowly in the distance towards the right, they're controlled by another point very far away outside of the image, but nonetheless it's there. So this is the third uh, direction 
uh, if you look upwards towards a uh, skyscraper because if you were looking straight in front of you you would only see a little bit of it of course so you must turn your head to see the top but the more you turn your head the more it starts converging uh, towards a point somewhere up there outside above uh, the image frame and the same can happen if you look downwards then all these lines will move towards some deep abyss point somewhere in the middle of the earth so here it looks like the stair is going up a little bit in the picture slightly although we know it's going down we're looking downwards to everything again we have this abyss kind of perspective but because the stairs is not going totally orthogonally down it's it's still a little bit uh, less than you see it somewhat going up but it's not going very far and downward objects usually you don't see much of it and we will see in the next video sometimes you can't even see anything of the stairs beyond just where they start so this is again a nice combination golden hill where you have a downward sloping uh, uh, road but also these houses are on a curve so each time you see different directions they move more and more towards different vantage points and this is of course a, a perspective dream if you have to draw this you have to calculate for each of these rotated houses you have to use its own point on the horizon which is here by the way and you can have if you start having curvy linear which means that the lines are becoming curved you can have even four vanishing points control points or even five if you want because there's one in the distance now i like to end my uh, talks with some after the theory and then relax with some practical inspiration some kind of neat things you could do and i'm talking about the point of view now a little bit more generically eh? because also philosophically a point of view can be something you can have the point of view of an african fisherman or you can have the point of view of uh, somebody working in Wall Street and so on and so forth. Eh? So, but geometrically it's good to have a high vantage point. Eh? Professionals, they will always uh, shoot things with cranes and the like, because otherwise, especially if you're a small guy, you will only see uh, the first row of people and now you can see over them. Eh? For example, here, this is shown very nicely. There's something going on here. There's, there's something working on the road and these buses need to pass each other. This one even has to drive over the pavement because here is also something apparently. Now, if you were shooting it from the street uh, position here on the pavement, uh, you would only see the front of the bus. You wouldn't see even this and you wouldn't see what's actually happening, what's the cause of this uh, problem. Uh, and if you would want to look at this here, you may want to stand in between the buses, but apart from the fact that this is probably dangerous uh, you still wouldn't see everything but now you see almost like from top uh, a sketch of everything laid out what is happening where but you still have also the nice perspective view because you have the front of the bus and so on so same here uh, do you want to be inside of the this is in Varanasi you could stand somewhere here on the gats but then you don't see first of all you don't see the back scenery as nicely and, and the people are far away and so on. so you can better go in between them then you see the live action and Robert Kappa was a uh, war uh, photographer who always said hey, you have to be right in the middle of the action if the, if the bombs aren't flying around your ears you don't have good photos and he didn't have technically very good photos because yeah, he was in the middle of the war and so they were blurred and shaky but that that adds to the uh, spectacularness of the photos and they were very interesting because who has photos of the landing uh, in Normandy for example and so you want to go maybe not necessarily as a westerner in, in the water of the Ganges because it's a little bit dirty maybe for our stomachs but you can be on a boat and then you're still in front of all these people with the nice back scenery so it's a very nice way to photograph this scene or here instead of just photographing the boat from the side just shoot it together with 
the people, from the perspective of the people, as, uh, as you could say. Also here you can have this enormous traffic, it's already interesting by itself, but seen from the perspective of this bored co-driver who is just sitting there for hours and hours, me too by the way obviously, but at least I had a nice photo. Or the so-called bird type perspective, and then you are from a high vantage point, it doesn't have to be a balloon or a plane or anything, it can also be a mountain or what have you. And then you can even look on top of the birds if you want. Or on top of the beach. If this was a full beach this would look totally different again, but now you have a kind of Robinson Crusoe-like uh, appearance. I want to give one caveat, uh, some small warning. Uh, drones may be very popular, but if they fall on somebody's head then it's less pleasant. And some of them are quite big, so there are all kind of local laws and maybe you're not even allowed to use it in, in many, the most interesting places, uh, sadly maybe, but understandable. So here, for example, again, from a high vantage point, everything opens up. Eh? If you photograph from here, below, you can have, of course, also nice photos eh, of the terraces here and the people drinking beer and whatever, but you will see only this part. Not even, but maybe if you point your camera upwards you can see the top here. But now you see everything beyond it and beyond it and beyond it. And the three towers here of Ghent, that's the city. Or the frog perspective. Eh? Or, or you go like a small animal which is very close to the... First of all you already see the scenery here, all the leaves and something which you may not normally see, it's below your feet. But also you see the little bird peeking behind uh, this, 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 this needles of the, of the fir tree and he says, what's going on here? Who is this? So you get an interesting uh, perspective again. This is also a frog perspective and uh, looking at, up at the mushrooms against the tree. Or here, towards this cloister. And one uh, general rule of thumb is if you have small animals or children and try to shoot them from the height of their head or their eye because otherwise they are looking up to you a little bit and also perspective contracted so that can be funny also but if you want to shoot them more or less as they are more naturally in their normal shape and not their distorted shape then uh, you want to do it like this especially if it's children Perspective is a composition tool also. Eh? Where do you want to position yourself and how and why? Here I found it interesting on this market you could make hundreds of photos, everybody would do it differently. But I found it very interesting, all these huge mushrooms here you can uh, buy and cook. So I used it as a part of the scene and a, a foreground and everything behind it. Same here, an interesting way to, to photograph it between this bus and the, and, and, and the guy on the bicycle. And you see the reflection of the piñatas on the bus. So it's a different way of photographing than the straight on way. And you can follow strictly some limited set of rules or you can go creative. And you can say, ah, maybe I don't like this photo because it's not classical. But it is also very interesting because it's different. Or the line of sight. Uh, with the cannon here. And here, that's also perspective of course, people standing in front of you and interacting and pointing towards you and saying, hey baby, there's a guy sitting over there who is almost finishing the video for today because it has been enough. So thanks for watching. If you want to see more movies I will upload them, uh, not just about perspective but about many things photographers can benefit from to make ever more beautiful and more interesting pictures. I will do that more or less on a monthly basis because a good uh, video uh, costs a lot of time, but you can sus subscribe and then you can get uh, some uh, notifications when there's a new one. Or you can just query you or your friends for Meneer Photo Professor, and in this case, Perspective Part 1. And I will see you in Part 2, 3 and so on if you found it interesting. Okay, thanks for watching, have a great day, bye bye.